Oh, Barry Desborough, thank you very much indeed for coming back yeah. on to Talk Beliefs all the way from the south of France. So, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing since we last spoke and uh, have you been writing at all? I've been very busy where we live here, uh, so there's a lot, lot to do, but I do love my reading and I do love my writing and I've been adding things to my blog. Barry, last time you told us about endogenous retroviruses, so this time we're going to talk about Charles Darwin, yes. who of course established the principles of evolution and specifically why some people, especially creationists, yes. give him a bad rap. So. Could we start with perhaps an overview of who Charles Darwin was and yes. what it was that he discovered? Okay. He started out as a, a student of theology. He went to college courses to study, to become a priest. Uh, for various reasons, he, it, he didn't get on very well with it. But you have to look at Charles Darwin in the context of the time. The time was when Europeans were discovering more and more about the rest of the world, uh, finding other people, uh, maybe different colors, different cultures, certainly. And it wasn't clear at the time to anybody, it wasn't clear at the time that all human beings were the same species. And one of the major factors in Charles Darwin's uh, motivation was his, his own social context, which was the Darwin family, the uh, Wedgwood family. His, he married his cousin, which wasn't unusual at the time. Uh, and they were adamant, very, very, uh, strong anti-slavery people. Uh, they uh, and and it's unfair to characterise Charles Darwin as a racist. It, it, it's completely the opposite of the case. He came from this family, uh, who was absolutely adamant anti-slavery uh, people. And and one of the books I would I'll hold it up to the camera and see if you can see it. Oh yes, a, I'd recommend Sacred Cause. Sacred Cause, and it tells a history of how and why Charles Darwin was motivated to uh, oppose slavery. You know, we we hear about his trip to the Galapagos Islands, but before that, the the Beagle sailed all around Southern America. And he witnessed, witnessed the absolute horrors of slavery, the, the torture methods the, uh, that were used to cow uh, slaves uh, and so on. And it, it makes a very strong case for what motivated Charles Darwin, uh, an adamant anti-slaver. And then he ended up with his studies, he ended up uh, discovering and, and teaching us that all life was related. Before this, before Darwin, uh, the, the main um, so-called authority on human origins was Louis Agassiz. I think I'm pronouncing it right. He was Swiss, but he moved to America. A lot of people took a lot of notice of him uh, and he talked about the idea that different races, a race means nothing really, but different races came from different origins. So he believed that the Chinese came from here, the black people came from here, uh, the white people came from here. They're all differently created. Uh, and that would inevitably lead to uh, feelings of superiority on the behalf of... Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And some of that was understandable. I mean, in Europe, uh, there was the Industrial Revolution. There were, uh, you know, there was a lot of progress being made and so forth. And it, I can understand that the people at the time thought, oh, we're doing good. We're, we're you know, we, we must be superior in some way or other because we have done this. 
uh, another reference I can make is uh, Jared Diamond's Guns and Germs and Steel, which explains why the Industrial Revolution happened in Europe, uh, why it didn't happen in South America or, or didn't happen in South the Southern uh, Africa. Uh, it, it, basically a, a coincidence or a, just an accident of geography that uh, human that uh, Western civilization sort of changed gear, uh, but because it did, people just assumed, oh, that's because we're superior people. And, and it's not uh, a justifiable position <laughs> to make. It, it, you know, it's just an accident of geography, basically, that, uh, that uh, the Industrial Revolution and everything else that happened uh, happened in, in Western Europe. But going back to Darwin, he, he showed, he proved, and nobody believed, really understood at the time, that all human beings are one species. It was really thought at one time that uh, different races arose separately and that mixing those races was not a good idea uh, because they, it, it's almost like they were viewed them as different species. And by the way, Hitler has exactly, I've read a little bit of Mein Kampf, uh, not, not a lot of it, but he has pre-Darwinian ideas. He, he views races as different species. And, and he said, you know, it's a big mistake to mix these together uh, uh, because it produces all sorts of uh, mental disabilities, diseases, all of this sort of crap. Uh, where these ideas came from, I don't know. But the point is that Darwin showed, contrary to Aziz, uh, Louis Aziz, that all human beings belong to one species. Barry, another accusation I hear a lot against Darwin it, it, is that he was advocating racism and eugenics, what some mm -hmm. have called social Darwinism. So what exactly was meant by social Darwinism? Uh, okay. Some of this came from another relative of Darwin, Galton, who believed that you could breed a better breed of people, never mind races. If you, if you selectively breed, like you do with your farm animals, you are going to get a better result, uh, you know, of progeny from those. So it wasn't so much racism per se, it was the idea that you could select the weaker, uh, or deselect the weaker examples of the species, not let them breed, or even in extremist kill them, like the Nazis would do, uh, and and you would, your result would be a better and better breed of human being. Now, there may be an element of truth in this, may be a part of this, but Darwin is famous for saying that you could do this, but the cost to our souls, to the cost to our emotions, our morality would be too great. So uh, it's saying that perhaps, perhaps that could work, uh, you know, to produce the aims that you want, but we would lose our souls by pursuing such a, a course. So right from the start, Darwin recognised, and it doesn't take Darwinism. It, people have been selectively breeding animals for, for, for millennia. You, you select your best animals to breed from. You slaughter the ones that, uh, that don't look so good to breed from. But it doesn't take Darwinism to, to uh, recognise that. But Darwin is very strong in saying that this is not a course that human beings can take because the the cost of such a course is too great and have it's, you ever heard this barry from creationists because i know that you uh yeah 
you you talk a lot to creationists or they talk to you i should say yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, don't, they don't bring this up i'm sure creationists will complain about this that or the other but i always think their complaints are infantile infantile why do you think something can't be true because you don't like it if you don't like an idea uh it, it doesn't make it any more true or less true you know it most of us grow out of that way of thinking by the age of about three it you know i don't like it so it can't be true no i don't you will yeah but look face the truth deal with it you can't just ignore the truth that's not a way to deal with it and there's darwin faced up to the fact that selective breeding could introduce the human stock if you like uh, he, he faced up to the fact it, and he faced up to saying that if we took that course we would lose our humanity we would it, you know it's it's <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to let everyone breed <laughs> but you don't have to slaughter everybody who doesn't come up to your eugenic standards <laughs> so so there we are it's it but creationists said it's always struck me that that's a very very childish sort of response to here are the facts deal with the facts you know uh, respond to the facts don't just pretend they aren't there uh, that's not the way to deal with problems the acceptance of evolution and the belief or non-belief in God are completely separate issues, aren't they? So yeah. why is it the creationists want to confuse the two? It's very hard for me to understand. I've been talking to them for a long time. I'm in Europe. Most of the creationists are in America. Most of them ban me from their, uh, their sites uh, after a few exchanges. Uh, but one thing I read that uh, was interesting was that in the early pioneer days, people had very little. They passed the knife around. You know, the American habit of eating the, the wrong way around <laughs> as Europeans, and because they only had one knife. They, they would cut up their food, pass it on, cut up their food. And they were very poor they didn't have a lot of stuff and the only book they had most of them the only book they had was the bible and that book was an edition commonly an edition in which uh bishop james usher wrote his chronology in the margin saying so and so begat so and so begat so and so therefore the world is six thousand years old and this is where young earth creationism really got its start. I, I think so. And it was written in the Bible. So it was appeared to be scripture. Uh, there's an interdiction against adding or subtracting from scripture. But nevertheless, it came to be regarded as the word of God. It wasn't. It was the word of the Bishop of Russia. And so he wrote this in the margin of these Bibles that these people carried around in their wagons as they went west in, in America. And it came to be regarded as scriptural truth, the word of God. That God says the world is 6,000 years old. What do you say to theists who assert that atheists are kind of totally in love with the harsh realities of nature, that yes. the strong can overcome the weak, the survival of the fittest, etc.? It's not just atheists, it's theists as well who are interested in what are the realities of nature and i think it's also a moral question i think we've touched on this uh, before if you want to recognize what nature actually is uh, rather than hide away from it and pretend it isn't there then that's one choice but both atheists and theists will, if they are moral creatures, if they are moral creatures, either theists or atheists, they will want to 
recognize and understand nature because it's only by doing that that you can make any difference. If you do not have uh, as accurate a model of nature as you can manage to make, you can't really make any difference. And moral action is making a difference. So, you know, just pretending that it's not there, pretending it's go away, is, is not any answer to it. There's no, there's no love of um, nature red in tooth and claw. And why would anybody want to uh, uh, worship that? It, it's just recognizing that's that's how things sometimes pan out to be. And, it, and uh, you know, there is suffering in the world. There is, uh, it, it's very regrettable, both to atheists and theists, nobody, nobody enjoys the fact that there are horrible diseases that, you know, can bore into your eyes and uh, you know, all these horrible things that can go on. But unless you can recognize why and how these things happen, you have no chance of doing anything about it. So just pretending that it's, it's all hunky-dory is, is not an answer. It's not, a, it's not a moral position. I make a big distinction between uh, amoral people and moral and moral atheists and moral theists. I'm more, I'm more aligned with anybody who wants to try and improve situation in the world, the, the, the lives of people, uh, conquer disease, poverty, etc., etc. And it doesn't matter to me at all whether it's they are theists or atheists, and whatever motivates them, that's fine. If it's empathy that motivates them, that's, that's the key. That's the key. So, you know, you can have empathic atheists and you can have empathic theists and, and, and you know, we can work together. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Barry. Nice talking to you. You too.